So a key, a key way to authenticate users is using passwords, but there are other ways. Passwords is what you know, is also what you have. So if you have a token with you, that can be used to authenticate you. The idea is that the person who has that token is allowed to access the system. And there are different types of tokens. Uh, I think we will not talk about them so much. Uh, one that you use on a regular basis today is uh, your mobile phone. You can think of that as a token in, in the case that you uh, having it in your possession allows you to do certain things. Like when a bank, you try to do a, a bank transaction, the bank may send you an SMS or a message saying, here's your one-time password. And you need to have your mobile phone to receive that message to get that one-time password. So that's a combination there of using passwords, but the presence of your phone is necessary for that to work. The other types of tokens, uh, common other ones are swipe cards. All right, some card you swipe or hold in, in, in front of a scanner. And there are different types of cards like credit cards, uh, ATMs. So your ATM card is a token. You need to have that to get access to your account via the ATM. Of course, it comes also with a PIN, so it uses password type authentication as well. Uh, there are different types of cards. Some of them are smarter than others. Some of them have an embedded processor in them so that they can do some operations. There are some cards which will, uh, can be used to generate passwords. So they have a small screen on them or even a keypad on the card itself such that uh, when you want to make a transaction with a bank then it can generate a one-time password that you use to log in and, uh, and to, to do a particular transaction. We don't see them so often around. So there are different types of cards which are used as tokens. Another one which you may come across is the USB type tokens. So basically a USB disk and you carry it with you and you plug it into your computer and it has some software on there that the computer reads and that is, performs as a, authenticating you. If you have that USB token, the computer knows it's you. So that is uh, a little bit more common and commonly used. Some of them implement some cryptographic techniques to do that. Okay, they use uh, different encryption algorithms to support that authentication. But I don't want to spend too much time on tokens. Uh, one of the problems with tokens is if you must have it in your presence. Okay, that if you lose it, then you cannot be authenticated. Or if someone else gets a hold of that, then they can become you. Okay, so therefore tokens are commonly used with another form of authentication as well. It's not just tokens, but maybe token combined with password. And the other thing with tokens is that there needs to be usually some special hardware to read it, whether it's a, a, a scanner to read your swipe card needs to be installed, or if it's some special software or, uh, to plug in your USB disk to, to be able to read it. So that requires some, some setup in advance. There are some more advanced cards which have keypads on them or displays so that they can generate values for you, like generating random numbers where that generation is done such that it's aligned with the system that you're trying to access. And the, again, the presence of that token allows you to learn that random number, which is used really as a password to get access to the system. But tokens are a way for authenticating based on what you have. The other thing is what you do or what you, uh, what you are, so biometric authentication. And it works under the, the premise that uh, some of the, your physical characteristics are unique. That no one else has those physical characteristics. So if we can measure those physical characteristics as some registration phase or some enrollment phase, and then when you try to access a system, uh, again, those characteristics are measured and compared against the registered characteristics, and if they match, then you're authenticated.
so what characteristics can be used? Facial characteristics, your shape, the, the position of uh, your nose, your eyes and so on, on, on your shape, on your face. Fingerprints, an obvious one, and we use that quite often. Here at SIT, every day I scan my fingerprint when I come to work and when I leave. When we access some of the rooms, there's a fingerprint reader on there, so that's a, an example that we see quite common. The shape of your hand can sometimes be used to distinguish between people. Your retina or the retinal pattern, which is basically the, think of the, the blood vessels in your eyeball, they uh, can be used. Your iris, your iris is the coloured part of your eye. Your signature, so the way that you, you, you sign your name, we use that all the time. And your voice, so the pattern of your voice can be used to try to identify a particular user. my pictures. Oh well. So for the iris and the retina, I'll just bring up some pictures so you're clear on that. So your iris is the coloured part around your pupil and if you can see there's a lot of patterns in here and those patterns are unique to the individual. So n the normal approach is a normal camera takes a photo and or uh, uses a video can analyse those patterns and then later when you want to access a system again the same process takes place and they compare against the patterns which are registered and those which uh, you supply and, and see if there's a match. The retina, retinal scanning involves looking at the really the blood vessels on your eye. Okay, again, they form some patterns and they're unique amongst the individuals. This requires to scan the, to do a retinal scan requires a, a special light scan. You can't use a normal camera to scan here, so it requires some special equipment to do a scan, which is usually much more expensive than just a normal camera. The idea with these, and also the others, is that the first phase when you register, same as you register your password, you choose a password when you create an account, we need to do some registration or sometimes called enrolment with uh, biometric authentication. So they take a photo, say, of your eye or you scan your fingerprint in the registration process. They don't just store a copy of the photo of your eye or a copy of your fingerprint. There are algorithms applied to try to extract the patterns out of that. So it's important to recognise that when we use biometric authentication, we don't just have a photo of the eye we actually, or there are algorithms that try to work out a template or a, uh, some equations or some key features of the eye that make it unique to you. And usually they're stored as uh, some data points or some equations. And then when you try to authenticate, again another photo is taken of your eye and the software then tries to extract the key features of that second one when you authenticate and the features are compared. And if the features are a close enough match, then you're authenticated. If they're not close, then you're not allowed in. And importantly, in most of the cases, that it's not an exact match because of the uh, inaccuracies of taking the, uh, collecting the data 
So when you register your I, then the system records that. But then when you come to access the system, it takes another photo. The photo may have some inaccuracies in that it may be a different position as to where you first registered, slightly off the centre of your eye. There may be a different orientation, different lighting. Uh, there may be some dirt in, in some cases. So it won't be exactly the same photo. And the features that it recognises will not be exactly the same as those that are registered. So the system must find a match which is close enough. It's not an exact match. And that leads to some problems. Same with fingerprint and all the other biometric systems that it's when we try to check if this is the right person, it's not an exact match. It's saying, all right, enough parts of it match, therefore we'll let them in. But that can lead to inaccuracies in the authentication. So the next few slides just uh, show some of the trade-offs between the different physical characteristics and we'll discuss some of them and this issue that the, the match is not exact. Compared to passwords and tokens, they usually require much more complex techniques to work. They usually require some special hardware, maybe a camera or, or a fingerprint reader. So more expensive to set up. So uh, that's one of the trade-offs. Uh, in some cases, they can be quite accurate. But we'll see in some cases, they, their accuracy can be uh, cause issues. That is, they cannot authenticate the person correctly. And we'll define that. So which one's better? Which one's more accurate? Well, a rough comparison is shown here amongst those different physical characteristics of cost versus accuracy. Cost is how much it costs to, to use the, or to, to buy the equipment to do this. Accuracy is how good it authenticates or finds the correct person. And we'll define it a little bit more later. Uh, but it's showing in this plot that the worst accuracy are the ones on the left, voice, face, signature and hand meaning maybe that someone can uh, masquerade as you, pretend to be you, if they can uh, use signature. those. They may copy your signature, copy your face, well, no, but uh, they may have a face or, or adjust their characteristics such that when the system compares theirs with what's stored in the database, it may be a close enough match to someone else that the system accepts it. Right, we'll talk about... Uh, the definition of that accuracy in a moment. The best is the iris scanning, so taking a photo of your iris. But the most expensive is iris scanning. Okay? Retina is also expensive. I think iris is coming down a bit. Uh, but it's still, even though you use a normal camera, it still needs to be a quite accurate and stable photo to do that. So a rough comparison or trade-off between cost and accuracy so which one's best? There's no one best solution. It depends on how much you're willing to spend and how accurate you want. And there's actually there's two main levels or two main measures of accuracy, which we'll see in a moment. The general approach for each of them, there are three steps. Usually we use enrollment. Sometimes we call that registration. Same when you set up your account, you register your username and password. When we set up our system, we enrol the user. And that involves, we need some physical user interface. If it's fingerprint scanning, we need the fingerprint scanner. And the enrol enrolment may involve scanning the fingerprint, the user supplying their name or some ID, PIN in this case, maybe a, a name and password, depending on the system. The, the sensor senses your physical characteristics and converts it into a set of features. So it doesn't just take a photo of your fingerprint, it doesn't take a photo of your eye. It takes that photo or that image and then does some pattern matching or pattern recognition on that to try and extract some key features from that image. 
and those features are stored on the system. In the same way that one, when a user registers their username and password, the username and password are stored in a database. Here the features and the name of the user are stored in a database on the system. This is the enrolment phase. So the features, say, in a fingerprint may be some unique points that identify that fingerprint. So they do analysis and try and identify some unique points there or some unique changes in the curves of your fingerprints that identify you, those features. Then, once you're enrolled, so you register, you supply your name and, and your features of your uh, physical characteristics are stored in the database. Then there are two things that we can use biometric authentication for. Verification and identification. Slightly different. And slightly different in terms of the difficulty in doing it. First, verification. This is a user comes to the system, they've already enrolled, they supply, say, their fingerprint, they also supply their name, PIN or ID, so they supply their identifier saying, I am Steve and here is my fingerprint. And what the system does, right, it senses your fingerprint, it extracts the key features from that sensed fingerprint, and then since you supplied your name, the system looks up in the database and finds the recorded values from the enrolment. So when you enrolled, your features were stored. And your features, they say, we store them in a template. So it's, again, not the exact photo of your eye or your fingerprint. It's a, a set of key features which is called a template for you. So since you supplied your name, the template for you is extracted from the database and the features from your fingerprint are compared to the features in that template. If they are close enough, there's a true answer returned, you're authenticated. If they're not close enough, you're not authenticated, you're not allowed in. So the feature matcher in this case just compares your template, your features which were obtained from enrolment with those obtained when you scan your finger to try to access. And if it's true, then you're verified. It, the system verifies this is Steve because the fingerprint supplied matched that which was enrolled. The other process is identification. And if you see people walk into SIT in the morning or leave it af in the afternoon, you'll see that they scan their fingerprint and that's performing I identification. We don't type in our name or ID, we just scan the fingerprint. What happens? You scan your finger, the sensor gets the, the data, it identifies or extracts some features from that. And now, the features extracted have to be compared against all of the templates stored in the database. That is, for SIT, all of the, the faculty and staff members have their features stored from the enrolment pr procedure in the database, the end templates, and the one that was sensed is compared against that. And if you find one of them is, the, uh, is a close match, and we'll have some threshold, where all the others are not a close match, then that one is the user which is identified. If there are multiple which are a close match, then we don't identify the user because it could be one of several. Or if none of them are a close match, again, we haven't identified the user. So the result here is that the user is identified or not. Slight difference. Which one's easier to implement? Verification or identification? From the, the system implementation, which one's easier to do? Verify user or identify user? Wrong, not identify. Anyone else want to guess? <laughs> Quick, anyone? Verify, good. Why? Well, it's to do with the feature matcher. 
It's easier to implement the feature matcher because with verification, all we're doing really is we've got a fingerprint, for example. We get some features from that, some key points on the fingerprint that the algorithm detects. And we extract from the database the features from the user who entered their name and compare them. If they're close, close enough match, true. Whereas with identification, we supply a fingerprint, we get some features, and we have to compare that with all the, of the possible fingerprint features for every user. So the comparison is harder. That's all. Here we just compare with one. Here we have to compare with all in the system. It may take more, lo more time, especially if there's a large number of users in the system, like millions, for example. With respect to the matching, we will not look at any of the algorithms for how they extract features or how they do the matching, but the idea is that the algorithm uh, compares the features extracted for the, against, say, one of the templates and determines a score, gives a score as to how close it is to match, what's the closeness between the supplied one and the enrolled one. And if the score is above some threshold, they are authenticated. If it's below the threshold, then they're not authenticated. Now, the, that leads to some problems. If the match is not exact, then we may get errors. And this picture tries to describe what, what can happen. Let's have a look. On the horizontal axis is a matching score. And the idea of this picture is that a normal user, say a genuine user, when you compare their supplied values against the registered values, the matching score sometimes will be very high. That match, a high matching score means it's very, very near, almost exact. Okay, so it can be, think on, as we go right further, it means it's, it's very high. But we may have some average value. Right? On average, we're very close, and that's acceptable, the average matching of a normal user. But sometimes I may try to scan my fingerprint, and the system compares against my registered one, and maybe I didn't put my finger on the right orientation. Maybe there's dirt or moisture on my finger, and therefore I'm the genuine user, but the system comes up with a lower matching score. It's, it's not a close match. So sometimes we may get a lower matching score. And this bell curve here for the genuine user tries to illustrate that. Right? In most cases, we'll have a close match, but sometimes we'll have a, uh, a low matching score. And that's this left-hand tail of the bell curve here. And what we do in the system is we set up a threshold a decision threshold, and we say if the matching score is above the threshold, they pass. If below, they don't get in. If we set the threshold high, if we increase the threshold, then if we see if we have a low score, maybe my finger is dirty or has moisture on it, I may not be accepted into the system. The systems may see I have a low score below the threshold, then I'm rejected. I'm not authenticated. And we can say that's a false non-match. So it's a, a non-match. It, it, the system said this one does not match. You are not Steve. But that was wrong. I was. Okay, so we call that a false non-match, or a false negative is another name you'll hear. It was the correct user, but the system returned, no, it's not the correct user. So we've made a mistake, we're inaccurate, it's false, and it's a negative. It's returned, no, it's not the correct user, or non-match. We don't want that case to happen. 
Right? We don't want the system to say, when I scan my finger downstairs, say, no, you are not Steve. Well, it's possible because of the inaccuracies in the, in the measurement, in the sensing. Now, from another perspective, someone who's not me. So I've registered someone who's not me, who's maybe in, trying to pretend to be me. They may have a profile of their fingerprint or their uh, physical characteristics. And in most cases, their profile will give a low score. It will not match mine. Compared to my fingerprint, the, the score for someone else should be quite low. But there may be chances that, again, because of inaccuracies when I registered my fingerprint, there may be chances that the system, when someone else scans their fingerprint, the system thinks it's me. And that's, so this second bell curve tries to illustrate there's a probability that the matching score that this imposter user gets may be high enough such that it exceeds the decision threshold. What that means is if, if the imposter is lucky or if the system is set up so the threshold is quite low, then the imposter scans their finger, the system says they have a high score, it's above the threshold, so this imposter is accepted in as me. This is called a false match. It has matched me when it's not me. So false, again, it's an error and it's a match that the system has returned successful when it should not have. Also called a false positive. The system returns positive, you are Steve, but it was a mistake. So we talk about false negatives and false positives or false non-matches and false matches. Both of them we don't want. Both of them are errors or lead, uh, what we say inaccuracies of the system. But Generally, it's a trade-off between the two. If we want to reduce the number of false non-matches, the times when it rejects me, the normal user, then we can set the threshold to be high. Sorry, hang on, which way? If we, no, we set the threshold to be low. If we want the system not to reject me, then I set the threshold to be low. We move the threshold to the left. But the problem, what happens then, is that the system may accept someone else as me. So if I want to reduce the false non-matches, I may re increase the false matches. Or the other way. I don't want anyone else to be able to access as me, the imposter to be a get, get access, so I set the threshold to be very high. Meaning if, they, if the match is not very, very close, they will not get in. But that may mean more times I'm rejected. So it's a trade-off between those two, the false positives and false negatives. And most or all the biometric systems have to deal with this trade-off. Some have better trade-offs than others. This tries to illustrate that the trade-off between the false match rate and the false non-match rate. In a general system, let's say just for system B, we have some system and it's really showing that you either get a low false non-match rate, say at this point on the curve, a low false non-match, but you get a high false match rate or you can have a low false match rate but a higher false non-match rate or somewhere in the middle. That's the idea here. Which one do you want? It depends upon what your application is. Let's say we want a very high security system. We don't want imposters to get in. So we, we don't want anyone who's not the real user to get access. So we'd like to be in this operating area. That is, we want a, a very low false match rate. False match rate, false positives. We don't want to allow imposters to get access. So we want a false match rate to be very low. But that may mean we get a high false non-match rate. 
Imposters don't get in, but normal users are rejected quite often. That's what may happen with high security applications. And that may be reasonable. Okay? So let's say we wanted high security on, this, on one of the rooms here. We have fingerprint. We could set the threshold such that it's very hard for the imposter to get in, but it means quite often it rejects me, the normal user. Another application of forensic applications where, say, law enforcement need to prove that it was a particular person. So here we want the opposite. We want a very low false non-match rate, a very low false negative, and we may accept a very high false match rate. That is, it should never reject the correct person. So there's trade-offs depending on your application, wh which operating point you want to work at. The last slide, I think, for this shows some of those values, puts values to some different applications or different physical characteristics. Again, on the horizontal axis, we have false match rate, the false positives. This is the system saying, yes, you're allowed in, but in fact you're an imposter. So the imposter is allowed in. What's the percentage of false match rates shown here from quite low, 0 0.00? 0.01% up to 1%, a logarithmic scale. And on the vertical axis, false non-match, false negatives. This is the percentage of time that someone is rejected when they're a normal user. And it gives some data points there. Let's see some. For example, with fingerprint recognition, the blue circles, or the, the white circles, in fact. This line here. This is showing the typical characteristics with fingerprint applications. It's saying, if you want a false match rate, which is low, very low, that is, never allow the imposter in, then you've got to accept a false non-match rate in the order of close to 10%. So if you want the false match rate to be low, very, very few imposters get in, that may mean that maybe up to 10% of the normal users are rejected, or 10% of the times the normal users are rejected. That's what the picture shows. If you want a lower false match rate, you're going to have to accept a higher false a lower false non-match rate, you have to accept a higher false match rate. With voice recognition, the black squares, if you want a low false match rate, you've got a very high, in the order of 50 to 80 percent, false non-match rate. What that means, if you want to never let the imposter in. Then you can set it up, but maybe 50% of the times the normal user will be rejected. And the last one, maybe the best case. The best case is the furthest to the bottom left, where they're both low. The worst case is the furthest to the top right, where they're both high. Which one's furthest to the bottom left? Well, here, this diamond, the blue diamond, is the iris scanning. This is saying if you're using iris scanning, you can get a very low false match rate. That is, someone says they are Steve. They come up to the iris scanner, it scans their eye, and 0.0001% of the time, it'll accept them. Most of the time, it will, it will identify you are not Steve. So identify post imposters quite well, but several percent of the time it will reject me. Okay, When it scans my eye and I say I'm Steve, maybe a few, one, two, three percent of the time it will say no, you are not Steve. But that's considered the best in terms of accuracy.
but still very expensive to do okay, compared to the others. And that is all we want to cover on these other authentication techniques. In summary, the user presents their ID and some authentication information. And the system verifies that they're authorised to access the system. And that authentication information, we've spent some time on, it could be passwords, what you know. Maybe today we mentioned it could be tokens, something you have, or it could be something about you, your biometrics. With respect to passwords, you are going to have to implement websites, applications which need to store user information. And you'll always remember, you generate a random salt, you store that, and you store a hash of the password combined with the salt. Which hash algorithm to use is a, is a, a question we didn't really talk about. MD5 is not considered secure anymore. SHA, uh, SHA-256, SHA-512 are considered secure, but for storing passwords, the hash algorithm, we would like an algorithm which is what? Fast or slow? Do we want a fast or slow hash algorithm? Hands up for fast. For security to stop the attacker. We want a slow hash algorithm to stop the attacker at least. Remember what the attacker does is they calculate hashes on many possible passwords. The slower the algorithm, the longer it will take them. So from that perspective we'd say we'd like a slow algorithm. What's the problem with a slow hash algorithm? Well, when a normal user goes to log in, your system needs to calculate the hash. If it takes 10 seconds to calculate the hash of one, one password, that's good from the perspective of stopping an attack, but when I try to log in, I supply my password, the system takes 10 seconds to respond. You're logged in. So we need a trade-off there. It needs to be slow, so it's hard for the attacker to try many passwords, but fast enough such that the system responds to the the normal user. There are some algorithms, hash algorithms, designed to be configurable in terms of the speed. So there are different algorithms recommended for storing, uh, for using hashing of passwords. I think some are called S-crypt and B-crypt, and there may be a couple of others as well. With respect to choosing passwords, an important thing for a large system is to make users aware of how to choose good passwords and the, and the benefits of choosing good passwords. It's not so good in practice to force them to use particular types of passwords because they will either forget them and not access your system or write them down and release them through other means. Tokens and biometrics can increase the security but they often come at an extra cost and more inconvenience for users. So passwords are still widely spread. Getting users to choose passwords in a good way is still hard and leads to security issues. And still many people have accounts hacked into where someone guesses their password and can do something with them. Multi-factor authentication comes into play a lot where we don't just depend upon one authentication technique, we combine it with another. Build up the security. There are many other things with user authentication which we don't cover, some of them are listed there. <coughs> 